Hello and welcome. Today is a first part of three series on intelligent process automation hosted by Decisions. And today we're going to be talking about our financial services capabilities and about growing your banking customer base. So, so why are you here? Uh, what value does Decisions offer? We will be covering that topic today. We will also be covering what is important to your prospects, to, to your customers, and to you as an organization, and, and how you can leverage decisions in order to, to accomplish uh, having great customer experience, growing your uh, consumer loan uh, application clients, and, and satisfying your customer needs. Um, so a little bit about decisions and why we are here. Uh, decisions is a no-code rules-based workflow automation tool. And when applied in the financial services industry, we are helping organizations turbocharge uh, their ability to, to navigate the complexities of regulation, of compliance, of loan origination, of, of, of any of those aspects in and around the environment that you live in as, as a banking executive. We have found and our financial services clients have found that our solutions work really well for rapid change, for, for rapid customer growth in and around loan origination. Um, we have the ability in our technology because we are no code to, to deploy faster than you could see from say a pre-configured solution. Uh, myself and, and, and our other hosts will be discussing that today. Uh, we, get our, we get feedback from our clients on a regular basis uh, about how they are uh, capable of controlling their destiny in a no-code application, how they are able to apply rules that can move at the speed of business, um, and we will jump into that. My name is Jeff Ward. I am the Director of Financial Innovation at Decisions. Um, I've been in, in, in and around banking. I've been a commercial loan officer. I'm a recovering banker uh, for about 20 years. Um, today, I have a gentleman who is joining us. His name is Jim Perry. He is a very well-established uh, consultant, strategist, and speaker, and, and works for and represents Market Insights. Jim, thank you for joining us. Jeff, thank you. I appreciate the invitation, and I certainly am grateful for the opportunity to spend a little time with you and the folks who have joined our call today. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a senior strategist at Market Insights. Mm -hmm. um, we've been around for quite a number of years, uh, close to 30 years now. We're a consulting firm. We originally started in Chicago. Our headquarters is now based out in Seattle. And mm -hmm. over the course of all of those years, we've really been focused on providing data-driven strategies that are going to help community banks and credit unions across the United States navigate all the changes in the marketplace. Um, mm -hmm. My colleagues and I have really earned an, a kind of a reputation, I think, for helping position people for growth. Um, as a matter of fact, our tagline is dedicated to helping you grow. And that's really kind of part and parcel of what my work is about as a consultant. Um, I've been doing this work now since about 2005, uh, everything from strategy development to digital transformation, marketing, branding, culture. Um, I get to work in all of those areas with some of the best bankers uh, on the planet. And um, fortunately, I also have an opportunity to speak, as you mentioned, uh, around the country. And I've even had an opportunity to speak with international audiences. So um, I enjoy what I do and nothing is more exciting to me these days than being able to talk about new solutions to some of the problems that have faced banks for years now. Yep, I, and we appreciate that. Also, congratulations. I hear that as of yesterday uh, on LinkedIn, you're one of what, 20 individuals, or, or correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the most influential people in the US to talk to and listen to about banking. That's pretty exciting. It was, it was kind of a surprise and, and pretty exciting to be included in this list of 20 folks that, mm -hmm. you know, they say, look, you should follow these folks because they're talking about things you need to know about. So, um, yeah, 
that was that was a pleasure. Well, congratulations, and we're honored Thanks. to have you with us today on the tail of that award. Thanks. So, so as you travel in these circles, right? These financial these financial services circles, and in your network, uh, what emerging trends do you see today, or, or what? What's, what's hot on topic today? What are, what are people thinking about and talking about? There are honestly so many things that are on everyone's mind because the world around them, the financial services ecosystem is being confronted with so many challenges and opportunities all at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are so many trends uh, that I think are on people's minds, but the ones that I talk about the most have to do with consumer behavior and technology. Now, yep. sure, cybersecurity is right up there. Yep. Um, talent, you know, all of these things are important, but the two that I think are moving most rapidly and have accelerated most during the pandemic are the mm -hmm. issues of consumer behavior and technology. Um, yep. Now, obviously they were, changing the landscape before the pandemic. But as I say, they really hit the accelerator pedal over the last two years, because as an example, you know, this year as, you know, pandemic fatigue, consumers are searching for new ways to like seek comfort, navigate inflation, you know, mm -hmm. really get their needs met. They're looking to their financial institutions to really know them better, to serve them better, to deliver a more personalized uh, experience. And that can't happen um, in the old analog way of doing banking. <laughs> you know, we, we, as a matter of fact, uh, Forbes just about two weeks ago released a study that they had conducted 78% of banked Americans prefer to do their banking digitally on mobile yep. and on their computer. 78%. Yep. That's gigantic. It grew like double in a matter of three or four years. Um, and that's yep. certainly true, especially as the youngest consumers like Gen Z are coming into adulthood now. Mm -hmm. So it's like, guess what, mm -hmm. folks? The digital future is not just here. It's going to keep accelerating. So we have to pay attention to that. And then on the technology front, I mean, look at the innovation in artificial intelligence, in machine mm -hmm. learning, in the kinds of capacities that are impacting both back office and consumer facing kind of technologies these days. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so much happening that I think sometimes bankers can miss it. You know, they're all caught up in the, in the actual hard work of daily everyday banking. And they're not always aware of all that's happening. And the big challenge in it all is that these two trend lines, as they intersect, that's what's necessitating the most change in the industry. It's really pushing people to think about doing things in new ways. Yep, yep. When you, when you are in these circles and you talk about, you know, these challenges and thinking about doing things in different ways, you know, I would, I would assume that there would probably be pressure externally, customer mm -hmm. facing customer expectations and internally, how do we deal with change? How as an organization, when we've always done these things this way, how do we go about doing things differently? Would that be fair? Absolutely. Um, you know, I often think about so many folks that work in this industry have been in their job for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, sometimes longer, um, especially when you talk about some community-based institutions um, that you can find folks that have been in their job for 25 or 30 years. And even if it's only five years, it's still human nature if we've been doing things a certain way every day for all of our career, mm -hmm. change can be challenging. Change can be difficult, especially when the change we're seeing these days is requiring so many do, new different skill sets. Mm -hmm. So on the external side of things, you've got customer attrition and churn. 
that's happening more significantly than ever before. Because one of the things that consumers realized during the pandemic, wow, I actually have more choice than I was aware of. I mean, this started way back uh, in the Great Recession. And again, it's accelerated over the last two years. But you've also got the competition from fintech, big tech, uh, the incursion of a very of embedded finance that's coming to us um, outside of banking per se. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of challenges on that front. And then I was just talking to a banker the other day that was saying one of their particular challenges is that talent is so difficult to attract right now that you've got open positions, but you, you don't have the pool of people. So what do you do? Do you bring them in remotely? But if you bring them in remotely, how can you create that personalized experience mm -hmm. that allows people to feel like you're still interested in doing business with them? So there's a yep. lot of challenge going on right now yes. in the industry. But as I say, there's also a lot of opportunity. Gotcha. Yep. So, um, you know, as we're kind of going through our conversation today, if any of our attendees have any questions that you would like to focus on, I would invite you to, to participate and ask away. We're, we're here to serve, and the best way we can serve is to answer your questions. Um, you know, as you're talking to uh, these community banks, regional banks, and, and these people that you speak to, I think tomorrow you're going to be at the Ohio Bankers Association. Uh -huh. um, yeah. You know, what kind of strategies are, are you presenting to, to them to, 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 to deal with what we're talking about today? Initiatives, programs, you know, technology. What, what, what strategies are you offering, if you will? Well, one of the things that you and I have talked about before, Jeff, as you know, is all that's going on has its own market-specific filters, you know, mm -hmm. No institution is exactly alike. No market is exactly alike. And there are a lot of strategies, kind of broad strategies that can be deployed. But unless you're drilling down to the very specific needs of those uh, individual institutions, it can, it can be very difficult to say, no, you need to do this. Well, guess what? That might not fit with your culture. That might not fit. Um, with with your marketplace or your customer base. So everything has to be customized. Um, and But oftentimes, uh, because as I mentioned at the start, our firm is all about basing your strategic choices in your data, data about your market, data about your customer, data about your potential customer. Mm -hmm. um, and from that standpoint, I always say, let's take a look at how things have changed for you specifically. You know, what is your data telling you? And I think a lot of institutions, you know, one of the realities that's hitting this industry is people don't have the analytic kind of bench depth to be able to really keep looking at that data in real time. You know, they don't have the technology that's giving them those tools and they don't necessarily have the internal talent to help them do that. So they're in a situation where you need an outside perspective, right? You need somebody to come in and, and help you source through that. Um, but there's, there's so many challenges out there. Uh, but when it gets down to change and navigating change, you got to start with your leadership. Yep. One hundred percent. You know, when you're talking about any kind of digital transformation, most times it's not about the technology. It really is about leadership. You know, true leaders these days know that our capacity for change can actually expand as we lean into what needs to be changed. But oftentimes it's getting out of that um, kind of frozen place that you get so stuck, you know what has to change, but it's so big that how do you like 
sort through the pieces of that? How do you identify the steps? Where do you start first? And that's mm -hmm. part of what I enjoy doing is coming in and sorting through all of that for folks because sometimes it takes that outside perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that you talk about leadership and I think that leadership is critical uh, these days, right? Um, mm -hmm. Knowing that there are challenges, not knowing how to address those challenges uh, can can be you know a catalyst for you know a lack of unity, a lack of direction, a lack of focus. And I really appreciate organizations that have gone out there and identified individuals that that represent change, right? And and have put that stake in the ground that says yes, we are an organization that believes in digital transformation and have hired accordingly, or we are an organization that believes in customer experience and hired accordingly, um, rather than you know, the, old, the old days where the broad brushstroke fixed it all. Leadership is right. very important these days. Right. And I mean, it's also kind of a different style of leadership. Uh, one of the things that happened at a time when we were all in lockdown and everybody, everybody was working remotely, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, hierarchies were having to be challenged. Um, mm -hmm. Hierarchies were having to be changed. All of a sudden you had branch managers that were doing HR work. You had, you know, folks <laughs> that, that were having to navigate real, real difficulties just to be able to provide service to your customers. So I think in many ways that gave bankers a new opportunity to say, how can we kind of break down those traditional roles a little bit and realize that even internally, everybody has a very unique perspective on how to bring automation online, how to bring digital transformation to happen in a way that's going to most benefit the consumer. So we're starting to see more and more um, banks, more and more credit unions go through the process of saying, okay, instead of just assigning this to our IT person, you handle it, you know? No, we're going to actually bring people from an interdisciplinary focus. You know, somebody from who manages one of our branches, somebody from HR, somebody who's in charge of all the back office, uh, back office operations, you know, bring a team of folks together so that once you recalibrate your strategies, once you start thinking about the technologies you want to bring to bear, you're going to have greater buy-in because the one thing that will shut digital transformation down is if you don't have a culture that supports it. If you mm -hmm. don't have such broad understanding of what you're trying to accomplish that when you flip the switch and turn it on, you discover, hey, my team's not on board yet. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it sounds like, you know, that 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 catalyst for change needs to be twofold. One. Right. It needs to be one. You need to be able to to appropriately appropriately, you know, encourage and support your culture through that change. Right. Mm -hmm. And two, you need the technology that can match with the speed and, and, and need for change in in the environment that you exist. And I think that COVID is a great example of uh, as a catalyst for the, the, the essence and the need for change and rapid change, right? We were, we were caught flat-footed where business as, as we knew it was, you know, kind of branch-centric, come into the branch, do what you need to do. And then, you know, overnight, uh, stay away. I might get a disease that will kill me if I meet with you face-to-face. And, and a lot of people were caught flat-footed, obviously. Very much so. And that was across a rather broad spectrum because on the one hand, you had some institutions that had certain digital transformation strategies in place. Yep. They just hadn't really kind of moved into it fully. Yep. Yep. So it kind of pushed them into doing that. But on the other hand, you have some other institutions that the very best they could do was just push everybody to the drive-through, right? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll take care of you there. We'll still get it done. Mm -hmm. um, and so unfortunately, a lot of people missed opportunities. 
you know, there were some of our clients that decided they couldn't participate in the PPP program, as an example, because they didn't have um, the staff to process all the paperwork. They didn't have the time, energy, or effort to, to be able to do that. And consequently, they missed big opportunities. And yeah. on the other hand, you know, you hear of some banks that through the first phase of PPP, they had all hands on deck. You know, every employee was at a computer doing all that data entry. Oh my gosh. And realizing, you know, we're not making any money this way. This isn't going to happen. We've got to find new partnerships that are going to help us kind of automate these systems so that we can be more efficient. And I think that's one of the big changes that's also occurred industry-wide you know, that along with the kind of incursion of fintech competitors and big tech competitors, there's this realization that banks can't be so insular. They can no longer do it all on their own. They need partnerships. They need people they can trust and count on that can bring new tools to bear and make sure that their team has the capacity to work with those new partnerships. Sounds like you were teeing me up there a little bit. Are you <laughs> implying it's my turn to talk? <laughs> well, you know what? You know, I often think, Jeff, that, you know, when I first met you, when I first heard about decisions and some of the things you were doing, um, I thought, this is really amazing. It's going to take a bridge for some people to even be open to the concept of thinking about what's possible with no code, right? You know, mm -hmm. that New York Times story I shared with you about yeah. a week or so ago about yeah. the emergence of no code solutions and how that's kind of drilling down to so many industries. Still, it's like for financial services, I say no code, or it's like saying metaverse to somebody, <laughs> you know, they're, they're remotely aware of it, but they really don't know. So what can you tell folks today about decisions? Why decisions? Well, great question. Great question. So, you know, I think what's unique about decisions is that we are a no code rules based workflow automation platform. Now, that sounds like I'm speaking a foreign language to you. The way that we can boil that down is, is, it, is it, we give our clients the ability to move at the speed of business, right? Rather than writing or, or managing a, a product, compliance, regulation in traditional code, like, like Java, like C Sharp, like, like .NET, like, you know, COBOL, right? Rather mm -hmm. than being able to manage those products, those rules, those workflows, in a visual programming language, drag and drop, right? Um, okay. And that gives our clients the ability to, to have a platform, a tool that resides between the business and IT, giving them the ability to, to navigate uh, the complexities of change in real time. Um, we are believers in the collective power of people and the ability to change their environment their, their, their IT platform environment tech stack. Um, right. We exist to empower the business to be less, uh, you know, less needed, you know, less, I'm, I'm, the word escapes me, but, but less IT supported, right? Less, okay. less, you know, less ability to say, hey, IT, I need this fix. And IT gives us that fix, right? Right. Um, we analyze our client's environment. We look for ways that we can automate that environment. And then we provide them with the ability to execute and bring efficiencies to that environment. Um, and we serve financial services and the healthcare. Um, and our clients are Fortune 2000 clients in and around that space. Um, okay. We would be happy to share those names with anybody that would like to, you know, have further conversations with decisions, you know, following this, this webinar that we're hosting today. Um, and, uh, you know, 
we hear this over and over and over again when our prospects come to us and they and they want to understand the value of no code. We hear mm-hmm. that that our urgency to deliver change to an organization and value to an organization is a unique identifier for decisions. That's really great to know because as I've shared with you before, I keep running into uh, the situation with some of our clients and and some of the folks I know out in uh, uh, kind of the banking space Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that there are so many folks, especially, you know, that, you know, an asset range of, of maybe 5 billion and under, mm-hmm. they're still in a situation where they're rather dependent on their core providers for any innovation, right? Um, and that's worked for them for many, many years. But these days, it's that much more difficult because those core providers are pressed now to be bringing so much change uh, and innovation to their marketplace. People can be on waiting lists for a year, a year and a half uh, Mm -hmm. before, you know, the the latest iteration is available to them. And it's like, folks, our customers can't wait that long. Our processes uh, are too slow. And we're realizing, uh, as an example, I was talking to one recently, a banker recently, who had a situation where, like I say, talent is an issue right now. Mm-hmm. They, so they haven't been able to find lenders. Yep. Yep. Right. In, in their market. I mean, five years ago, you probably could have found all the lenders you need. Uh, not so much these days. Mm-hmm. So, that means they have to deploy the lenders that they have very strategically. And the last thing they want to be doing is bogging down those lenders with the kind of paperwork that that means they're not out in the field doing the thing that actually differentiates them from the digital only institutions. Mm -hmm. So, So in that kind of situation, you know, where maybe they've not had any fintech partnerships, maybe they haven't uh, looked outside of their core provider for any kind of innovation. How do you deal, Jeff, with with somebody that's in that situation um, Mm -hmm. that that needs to automate some of their processes, um, but just hasn't even thought about it before? Great question. Great question. So, you know, I think you know, the reason we're here today is talking about faster, smarter loan origination and growing your clientele base. You know, with decisions, uh, we are a no-code platform and, and, you know, purposely built to take on any type of use case an organization could bring to us. You know, I can think of more than a, a dozen use cases that, that we're happy to dive into, but two specifically really? today that I think are very relevant. We have a client in the middle of the country that mm-hmm. was fortunate enough to have decisions in place and, and leveraging decisions when the PPP program launched. And mm-hmm. they were able to leverage our capability to build a form and have integrations to the SBA so that when they said that the PPP was going to be launched on a Friday, on a Monday, they were ready and had production ready forms to deliver to their clients to apply for the PPP loans. And I believe that in a week, they had written more loans to businesses who needed that money than right. they had done the prior year, right? Wow. So being able to very, very quickly react to market stimulus and provide, provide a response to that market. Another example that I think is very unique and I think is very centric to financial services is that we had a client last year that came to us and was looking for a way to be able to increase or decrease an LTV based upon market conditions. Mm -hmm. And in the environment that they lived in, they were using a decision engine that that is well known in the marketplace. And Mm -hmm. if they wanted to increase an LTV, it was business calling IT and saying, Mr. IT department, I want to decrease LTV from 30 to 25%. 
right? And, and IT saying, okay, well, great. We're, we're very, very busy, right? We're understaffed. And it may take us a couple of days uh, to go through that development life cycle and push it to production, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In that couple of days is a lot of risk for this organization, right? right. From an LTV perspective, from a collateral right. perspective. From, right. from, from issuing funds out to borrowers. So they, they, they came to decisions and they asked decisions, is there the ability to create or to increase or decrease a loan to value in real time? Mm-hmm. And we put our resources together, our, our, our engineers that are very well trained on decisions on our platform and built them a proof of concept that increases or decreases LTV and the business had the ability, wow. the right authorities, right? Obviously, you don't want to right. give any banker the ability to change an LTV, <laughs> but giving the right authorities the ability to increase or decrease that LTV in real time. The, the one thing I often remind bankers is that uh, when you start talking about automation, when you start mm-hmm. talking about bringing um, some of these technologies to bear, um, Yes, you could be talking about um, kind of some shifts in individuals' uh, responsibilities, uh, Mm -hmm. but you're not just talking about replacing people here because Mm -hmm. you're always going to need your underwriter involved in the conversations with a partner like Decisions Mm -hmm. um, to be able to know what we need to do, when we need to do it, and who has the authority to make sure that happens? You know, you're not, if you automate any part of your loan origination process, you know, it's not just that you've handed the switch over to your IT professional alone. Well, you know, I think, I think you and I have talked about this and I think you're touching on a very delicate subject, right? I think right. that, you know, the, the differences or the advantages of decisions versus a technology that's off the shelf, right? Mm-hmm. Say it's consumer, a, a consumer lending loan origination, a commercial and industrial, you know, application, or, mm-hmm. or even a commercial real estate application. You can't just fix it and forget it anymore. Right. <laughs> I think that your clients would probably tell you that that what they're seeing today is that they've bitten off a piece of the digital transformation. And they're having their clients fill out this application online, but they may be seeing at some point in that application process that that they're losing the the, the, that completion of the application, right? Right. There's abandonment of the process. Yeah, in that sales process, with with applications that we see that are off the shelf that are built to manage that complete loan life cycle, if there's a tweak that needed to be made in that origination process, that's going to require that, it, that, that the business user go to IT and go through that development life cycle or right. go to the vendor that wrote that technology and ask them to customize that piece of that process. Mm-hmm. We all know that customization in the software world can be a bad word, can add complexity and cost and time. Cost. Right. to a very important process. On decisions, giving the business user the ability to look at that loan origination life cycle um, and find the places where I'm um, having customer attrition, where they're not completing the, the loan application, I can quickly make an edit or, or an update to that configuration, to that workflow and push it to production. So no longer is it kind of fix it and forget it, now, I could argue with you that we're all familiar with the iPhone. We're all familiar with how hardware has changed over the years. And, and now it's getting shorter and shorter and shorter between, you know, say version one and version 13 on the iPhone, right? iPhone one versus iPhone 13. Right. Decisions you could, you could make the comparison in that in a no code platform, now I have the ability to shorten the, the amount of time it takes to keep my technology relevant in an ever-changing world. If that makes sense. 
<laughs> makes perfect sense. And it's exactly the kind of thing that I think whether they realize it or not, most bankers want to be able to be more agile. They want to be able to make these kind of changes that don't take forever because they realize sometimes if they've got a process underway that's going to take them six months or a year or 18 months, they've lost a lot of business because once again, there are a lot of different options out there for folks um, and people have a lot more choice. So don't give me a slow clunky process or you're not going to hold, hold my attention. Um, yeah. The capacity I think to, uh, to really change that up so quickly, that's that's very impressive. That's one of the things about no code that kind of blows my mind. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. it's like, wait a minute, you mean it's not gonna take like six months to make this change? Mm -hmm. It's like, again, the, the ability to kind of meet the customer needs where they are, address those pain points uh, quickly, that can be the difference between success and failure. Yes. And, you know, what's kind of unique about decisions, right? So, so we could say, you know, off the shelf, we have a, a consumer loan origination solution that somebody could acquire today. Or right. we have the ability to act as a platform for an organization. And, you know, Everybody's familiar with Salesforce these days. It's the 900 pound gorilla, you know, from right. a CRM perspective. All of your bank clients have to reside with a core and have a large uh, ecosystem of technology that they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. The advantage of decisions is rather than ripping and replacing one of those databases, right? Mm -hmm. The cost, the expense, the, the analysis to understand you know, the impact of that rip and replace. Right. The beauty of decisions is that you could leverage us, you could bring us in, you could plug us in as an orchestration layer between all of those different databases, pulling wow. data out of one database, applying a rule and a workflow to it, sending right. it to another database and or causing a reaction to, to that data. We have a client on the, on the West Coast that is using decisions to prospect from within the organization. Oh, and what wow. I mean by that is that they're looking at their core, they're right. looking at looking existing at that data. client information, um, right. and they're and they're presenting to marketing the opportunity to offer Jim or Jeff uh, the ability to go refinance or buy a car based upon credit, based upon where they are in their in their existing loan facility and, and and meet them ahead of that need. And I think that you and I talked about the other day in preparation for this, that you thought it would really be nice if, you know, a year from now or, or six months from now, when you're ready to replace your Toyota, that your bank was there waiting saying, hey, Jim, we got your next model for you. We got the next credit facility for you. I mean, think about how simple that would be. Right. I know. That's, that's the thing. I've been um, you know, out on the speaking circuit for a long time, and I think I'm always beating the drum for database decisions that, you know, you've got to be able to get in there. And as I've shared with you, my bank, if they really looked at my transactional data, they would simply see that I've been making a payment to Toyota Financial for like the last dozen years and every two or three years that number changes so guess what that probably means i actually am looking at a different vehicle i've either leased or purchased a brand new car but at no time have i gotten any kind of offer any kind of inquiry any kind of anything by email by a text and it's not that my bank is like living in the dark ages they're just not accessing that data in a smart way, right? To, to really help deepen the relationship with me because that means, yeah, that piece of my financial life is with Toyota. 
Mm-hmm. And think about instead this. of my financial institution. And, yep. and it's because they're not looking at that. I'm glad to know that we're not just talking about a simple kind of plug and play solution here. You're talking about customized use mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to meet whatever your particular growth goals are. That's, that's amazing. That's exciting. Exactly. Exactly. We have, you know, I, I would say that we've got numerous clients, be it financial services, be it healthcare, you know, regardless of industry that are really leveraging decisions in that orchestration perspective, right? Mm -hmm. You know, instead of adding tech debt, instead of, instead of ripping out a technology, like I spoke about, Mm -hmm. using that technology, leveraging that technology for what it's built for best of breed, but connecting the dots with decisions, right? Okay. Through, we have, we, through the ability to, to integrate with pretty much any type of database that is out there, we're source agnostic, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. to be able to appro- apply um, process mining to look at any step in the process that, and, and look for bottlenecks where efficiency can be gained. Because okay. really what's important is the, the human aspect of this transaction, the relationship. Sure. People like to be able to do business with people that they like and they trust. And the technology is the point now where it can simplify that process, that paperwork, that manual piece of the transaction that after you and I have this conversation, after I figure out that you want the new Toyota, I've got to go back to my computer and key it in and key it in and key it in and pull your credit report and then share that with the credit officer All of that complexity is now simplified through a conduit to which we can apply workflow and rules. That's that's incredible. Because, you know, one of the things I think, um, you know, many bankers that I know, they may be thinking about these kind of solutions in terms of the retail customer, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe... Maybe it's because it's less complex in, in terms of the loan origination process, right? If you're yep. talking commercial, there's a whole different layer of, of information. But what I'm hearing you say is that this has the capacity to kind of work if you're focused on retail or commercial, mm-hmm. that you can draw from the kind of data sources that are going to help really automate this decisioning in a way, <laughs> decisioning, who knew? <laughs> uh, um, in, in such a way that, uh, you know, once again, they can free up their, their loan officers to be doing the kind of personal work, face-to-face work that is, is gonna make it a whole lot easier to establish the relationship and then support it once, once the loan paperwork is actually done. So, so think about this one, for a second. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I, I was going to say one thing I think about this though, let's say as an example, somebody says, okay, Jeff, get in here, show me what you can do. Mm-hmm. Let, let me figure out how this can work for us. Mm-hmm. The question always comes in my mind though, is it going to take forever to implement? You know, how how long of a process are we talking about here? Great question. So typically our clients come to us with a use case, right? Okay. And that and that use case can be, you know, that manual piece between CRM and, and some other application within the, the technology stack that they depend on. And they okay. come to us and they say, Jeff, or they say decisions, they say, show us how you would do it. And we, we define the parameters of success and a proof mm-hmm. of concept, right? Mm-hmm. And we okay. build it, we validate it, and we show it to them. Right. Um, I am very familiar with the, with the commercial loan origination solutions that are out there in the world. I'm very right. familiar with the length of those projects, sometimes mm-hmm. taking you know, six to 18 months to go from contract execution to live in production. 
Right. We're also very familiar with the licensing costs that 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 these organizations may charge. Decisions right. is a very has a very different approach to implementation and licensing. Right. Mm-hmm. Our implementation, because it's because it's a is a visual programming language, our implementation times are traditionally two to six months. Right. And wow. and you, to your point, you just said, wow, we've got organizations that we can provide as references that would be able to tell you such. Right. So we can we can back it up with customer proof to our success. The other thing that decisions offers if any of these organizations are looking at any type of commercial loan origination, consumer loan origination, or, com- or commercial real estate loan origination, right? The, the licensing nuances can be based on asset size, asset class, number of transactions, number of integrations, maintenance of integrations, seat user licenses. Okay. And I can go on and on and on. Decisions offers two types of licenses. One is a standard license. It's an annual fee. And one is an enterprise license. It's an annual fee. So we don't nickel and dime you on, on, your, on, your, on the size of your portfolio or the number of transactions that you do. Yeah, I know. I think that. that's really refreshing in the marketplace when I hear what some of these banks are paying. I know. And actually, that's honestly... Earlier, we talked about the issue of barriers um, to change. And honestly, dollar signs are the thing that is shutting a lot of people down right now. In term, I mean, margins are being squeezed. You know, they, they, they've got um, to manage a lot. That's why we're seeing the kind of consolidation we are in the industry right now, because in order to get to some level of scale, you know, you're seeing institutions coming together just so they can redeploy collateral, redeploy their kind of resources, both, you know, human and otherwise, just to be able to bring some of these tools on board because they're so blessed expensive. Um, And not only that, you know, they don't always have the skill set internally to maintain something once it's kind of brought online. Um, How do you guys support kind of folks once, you know, Mm -hmm. the deal's done, everything's working, all the rest, what's the interface between you and, and some of your clients? That's a, that's a great question. We provide free training. And wow. we encourage our organizations that, that, you know, once a use case is identified, once we go into the sales evaluation process, we encourage our clients to attend our training. And our training is, is around the calendar, different levels of training. And the thought process is, is such that we want to empower our, our clients to be able to control their destiny. Now, mm-hmm. that doesn't work for every organization. I think a lot of your clients, a lot of the organizations you deal with have that relationship with their core provider and they kind of fix it and forget it. We do have the ability to to maintain and and care for a client through through relationships so that if they needed a change, if they needed an update, we can do that for them. We're we're more than happy to do that. But really the the impetus and, and the value of decisions is really empowering our clients to control their destiny. So I'm assuming that 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 probably means you're also there when there's a new regulation or new compliance issues that people are facing that all of a sudden, wait a minute, Jeff, this doesn't work anymore. We've we've got to change this up. Uh, Sounds like you're, you're pretty attuned to that. Very attuned to that. Also very attuned to with, with the use of the platform to be able to make those updates and make those changes in very real time. You know, there is an organization that, that I'm in communication with right now that's very concerned about the, the CFPB rule that's getting ready to go into effect. And, right. that, and that the banks are going to have to be able to report 
what loans they've originated or declined in 30 days or less in the foreseeable future, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and what we're talking about is giving that organization the ability to look at the amount of time that it takes for them to originate a loan. And to your point, when you, when you talk about the complexity of larger credit facilities, you're right. talking about adding time to that, to that underwriting process, right? Mm -hmm. No mm -hmm. longer are you looking at the borrower's credit score, the borrower's employment status. You're looking at a whole new level of complexity, right? right? You could be looking at the health of the business. You could be looking at the accounts receivable, accounts payable, you know, the majority ownership, you know, what the structure is of the organization and, and really adding automation and rules to how that information is received will cut down on the amount of time it takes to originate that loan. Mm -hmm. And what I really hear you saying is, is even in terms of those rules, um, there's so much flexibility in a no-code solution about establishing those rules in such a way it's, it's not like, once again, you have to have no code. Um, you know, you don't have to turn this over to somebody that is going to spend several weeks just trying to sort out how they can actually do it. Um, exactly. exactly. Because timing is so important. You know, the, the whole purpose of our conversation, obviously, is this notion of growing your customer base, right? Because... Honestly, we're seeing so many different changes right now in the marketplace where pieces of business, all you have to do is uh, open QuickBooks if, if you're a business right now, and they're giving you loan offers. Um, mm -hmm. So for a bank or a credit union to compete in that environment, if they're going to grow, if they're going to keep doing things, they've got to work fast. Um, how did they, you know, some of your potential clients, right, mm -hmm. are, are going to have other choices out in the marketplace, mm -hmm. right? What do you tell them? Uh, how, how do you make the case for decisions? Great question. You know, I would, I would offer anybody that's interested to reach out to decisions and, and put us through the paces, right? Come okay. to us with a use case. Come to us with a, uh, a desire um, for off-the-shelf functionality. And let us show you our process. Let us show you how we let us show you how we would validate your need. Let us mm -hmm. show you how we would understand what you're trying to accomplish. Let us show you how we can configure decisions, not customize, but right. configure decisions to be able to address that need. We do it every day, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what I would, what I would offer is that if you're, if you're considering going through an RFP or if you're considering going and looking at off the shelf technology, think about the, the aspects of what you're trying to acquire. Think about right. how it was built. Think about, yeah. and you said this a minute ago, think about the customization that may be required to get that technology to fit your organization, right? Right. Custom, customization, we all know this, customization increases risk, it increases cost, it increases right. time. And then if you're having to maintain that customization, anytime that publisher of the technology makes an update, mm -hmm. there's the potential that your integrations could be broken and having to right. go back and, 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 and reconfigure those settings. Decisions would be configured to fit what need you have, when you need it, at the time that it's most appropriate. And we invite people, anybody, to come and put us through the paces. You'll be pleasantly surprised with the, with the urgency that we present ourselves to your needs. You know, you and I have talked uh, several times, Jeff, and one of the things that I'm really, really understanding and appreciating now is kind of the difference between what you're doing and what you can do and the typical off the shelf kind of loan origination solutions. So um, that's pretty impressive. I uh, hope folks reach out to you because um, 
again, there's so much available here in this no code universe that I think is going to be game changing for the industry. 100% game changing. You know, what, what our desire to do at Decisions is to empower our clients to stay ahead of change. Mm -hmm. um, why we do that is that we feel like and we believe wholeheartedly that the business and the IT can blend their abilities to stay in front of client expectation, regulation, mm -hmm. compliance, credit policy, you know, business environment change by leveraging our technology. And we start from the very beginning when, when our clients engage us in understanding their needs. Wow. We do it passionately. We do it with urgency. You know, we do it with humor. We wow. do it with compassion. We do it with everything that we can possibly do to satisfy our clients' needs. You know, you know Jeff, I'm aware say, we're... Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say I'm aware that we're getting pretty close to the top of the hour. Yep. Um, is if there's one thing you want people to remember from our conversation today, what would it be? What would it be? What would it be? You know, don't be afraid to try something new. Don't be afraid to get outside of your comfort zone, whether your organization needs digital transformation or not. Don't be afraid to go out and try something new. You may be surprised with what you find, right? If anybody has any questions about what we've discussed today, if, any, if anybody has interest in, 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 what, in what we've shared, please feel free to reach out to myself, uh, jeff.ward at decisions.com or Jim Perry at jperry uh, at uh, formarketinsights.com or, or reach out to sales at decisions. We're, we're happy to help. We're happy to address any kinds of questions that you have. And we look forward to um, future webinars. This is one of three, right? And our next one will be on April the 22nd. Uh, there is an individual, uh, he's the decisions vice president. His name is Will Pedersen. Uh, he's a great guy. He will be famous one day and will take over the world. Uh, <laughs> will approaches uh, customer success and customer experience uh, from a personal perspective and, and does whatever it takes to get stuff done. Nice. Nice. On June the 9th, one more, one more, sorry. <laughs> On sure, June yeah. the 9th, our, our decisions co-founder, Heath Oberman, will talk about the automation revolution. Again, what, oh. why, and how intelligent process automation is critical to organizations and in the world we live in today. You know, Jeff, the world around us is moving very quickly. And I, I think there are a lot of bankers that um, have had that kind of wake up call, that little reality check that says, oh my gosh, I, I really, I don't have any time left. I have to kind of start paying attention to these things. I'm just so glad that increasingly there are any number of resources and the fact that Decisions is out there with such an amazing resource. Thank goodness, right? Um, I'll be interested to hear uh, the rest of this particular series because transformation, I mean, that requires change, right? And um, you're, you're not gonna get there by doing it the way you've always done it. Yeah. There, you can't broad brush stroke it anymore. You can't right. be afraid of, of who moved my cheese. We got to keep pushing. <laughs> exactly. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. For, for any of our audience that, that attended, thank you so much. And again, if you have any questions, uh, reach out. We would love to talk to you and show us how we can solve your problems. 